Great. Right, Pete, let's start with you. Um, an easy one. In your presentation, you mentioned military spending and wealth inequality as major issues. These are not issues evangelicals are well known for campaigning on. Why is this? Do we make it worse by supporting politicians who are anti-abortion, but also pro-war and uncaring of the poor? There you go. Simple one. It's been very interesting watching the, the US presidential election because I think in the US there's a very clear demarcation between Christians who regard themselves as right-wing and those who regard themselves as left-wing. And those on the right wing are concerned about issues like homosexuality and abortion and so on. And on the left wing are concerned with health care and developing world inequalities and, and human trafficking and the environment and that kind of thing. I, I think the pattern we see in Jesus is that, is that Jesus, the strong, laid down his life and made sacrifices for the weak. And I think that is the pattern that in social justice our concern is for the marginalised, those who have no voice. And whether it's a pre-born baby in the womb with no legal protection, or whether it is a, a child scrambling on a, you know, on, on a rubbish tip in Cairo in a developing world city, God's heart bleeds equally for those. And I think in, in a way Christian ethics is a a rather interesting mixture of right uh, and left wing. But the, the, the overall uh, principle is all about being a voice for, caring for, serving the marginalised, the dispossessed, the exploited, those who have no voice, whoever they are. And I, I think there's a real opportunity for the church here, and this is why I included both sides in my presentation. I think we have to be, on the one hand, passionate about sexual purity and about uh, abortion and uh, about euthanasia and you know, care for the, the elderly and those with dementia and so on. On the other side, we have to be passionate about the environment, about human trafficking, about developing world poverty. And we have to be living that out by working hard, living simply, giving generously, and also being a voice whatever it may cost us. So walking in the path of the cross means on the one hand being prepared to bear one another's burdens and to be servants and on the other hand it means being prepared to stand up and say things that people will hate us for um, in protection of those who have no voice. Okay. Chris, do you think that the breakup of the church into denominations, and we're going back a bit, first Orthodox Catholic, second Catholic Protestant, caused us to lose a lot of our theology and knowledge of God worship so that the churches became more poor and could not meet people's spiritual needs, so they left? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, okay, well, that's going right back in history, isn't it? So we go back to a split in the 11th century. But I think the, the problem of speaking about church splits and denominations and so on is that these are all very different kinds of stories and different kinds of, different kinds of breakups that have gone on. So... Uh, you know, we can go right back to the early church. We can look at the Coptic church, the Armenian church, the Marianite church. There are many different kind of diverse churches that emerged in the early church period. So it's very difficult to say that um, so splits began in the 11th century with East and West or with the Reformation. There have been many different kinds of flavours of church that have grown up over time. Some of that's cultural. It's the geography. Uh, it's not always theological. Uh, it can be to do with particular traditions or styles of personalities that have arisen over time. So I don't think we can make a kind of simple statement about why there has been fragmentation. As an evangelical, I'm not really very interested in denomination. And to be honest, I don't really think to myself as someone Baptist or, or Anglican or Church of Scotland or whatever. I want to know, do they believe the Bible is the word of God? Do they believe Jesus Christ died for their sin? You know, these are the, the fundamentals that really matter. And I think the, the ground for unity is found in that, that doctrinal core, that common sense of the Lordship of Christ and vision for mission. And that's what really holds us together. So uh, the reasons for divisions and splits, I think, are very, very diverse. And I don't think there's one simple kind of story to be told about that over history. But the reason for unity, I think, is actually very straightforward. And that's something which can uh, overcome those, those doctrinal divisions. Okay. You, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the Scottish scene, but us no. Scottish Presbyterians, we yeah. don't split into different denominations. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's your view and the wrong views. Yeah. <laughs> Mez, 
Uh, question. Is the fact that you're from a scheme means that you have to use your mobile phone all the time? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I couldn't read it properly. <laughs> uh, Checking the football scores, but... Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by the Coptic Church. Yeah, fascinated by the Coptic Church. <laughs> hey, there's a great Coptic priest down in Kirkcaldy. Good for yeah, him. Never mind. Good for him. Right, Mez, do you have partnerships with similar schemes in the north of England? I am from Huddersfield. We have problems in this area yeah. of estate schemes of deprivation. I thought you'd like that one, so when you go. It's, it's Uddersfield, by the way. Uddersfield. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of a grouping called um, Reaching the Unreached that operate out of Speak Evangelical Church in Liverpool. They have a conference once a year called uh, Reaching the Unreached, imaginatively entitled. And um, a guy called Tim Chester is involved oh, yeah, we know. in that. He just wrote a book called The Unreached. <laughs> Reaching the Unreached. Right? Reaching, I think it's Reaching it's the Unreached. It's actually called Reaching so. the Unreached. Um, yeah. And so that, that, that's a group that I went and spoke at last year. Um, they're not, it's not a church planting movement specifically, whereas we, our um, conviction is that the local church must be the key mover in schemes to, to see ongoing growth and discipleship. But what it is, is it is um, a group of Christian workers. I think there's about 200 last time I was there. Mm -hmm. And um, they come together for a couple of days to encourage one another, listen to uh, talks. They try and invite guys who are working in council estates or, or housing schemes to give the addresses because they then address them to the... Um, so that's what's going on in the north of England. I don't really have that much. The reason we started 20 schemes is because the problem in Scotland is massive yeah. and it's not really being addressed cohesively um, by anyone. Now, just you know, simple answer to this one, really, but am I correct in saying that it, you will work with any Bible-believing church, you're not concerned about the denomination so much, or do we all have to um, become Baptist or whatever Charlotte Chapel is? <laughs> Paul's gone, so you can say whatever you want now. <laughs> um, one, we're not associated with Charlotte Chapel, not that we're not, not associated with them, but we're, yeah. we're called Nidri Community Church, that's the first thing. A second thing, we all get wet at some point. Um, <laughs> that's how I see that. Um, thirdly, um, well, as long as we're getting wet, eh? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No. no, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. I, I read the Bible, but... Um, um, oh, thank you. thank you. I'm a Presbyterian, I practice it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, that went over my head, that one. That, that's, that's what you call a posh joke. Like but, the water. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, yeah, we work, we will work. We have a statement of faith, a statement of faith, which if you've gone to the uh, 20schemes.com website, which is basically lifted off um, the Gospel Coalition. Um, people know about the Gospel Coalition. We lifted it off, made a few tweaks about um, egalitarian opposition. Obviously, it's not, it's for male eldership male leadership, male church planting leaders, um, although we're committed to, obviously, women working in schemes. So we made it those uh, two distinctives, because we obviously we believe ecclesiology matters, but we will work cross-denominationally. Great. Good. Um, I need to warn you about Mez, by the way. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met, and one of his really smart things is to pretend to be thick. <laughs> 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 And he did it very well at Moreland's College. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we used to call it Moron's College. <laughs> Peter, uh, a kind of really interesting question. In fact, this is for all of you, but we'll start with Peter and we'll go then Chris and then Mez. Um, I was asked uh, when we were having coffee, you know, we, we're, we're talking about questions that people ask, but what if people don't ask questions? How do you get people to ask questions? Is it your experience that people are asking questions or... You know, because that's a genuine question that some people have. I mean, my experience is people ask questions all the time, but um, you, any, any one of you guys, let's, I mean, because that's a genuine concern that some people have. How can I answer if people aren't asking? Well, I think there are people who ask lots of questions, and there are other people who ask none at all. And what to do with the people who don't ask any is that you ask them questions. 
So, um, and you can ask, everyone's interested in talking about their own ideas generally. So if you ask questions in a gently probing and sensitive way, they'll start to, to talk. And then you can draw out what they believe and then you know, start to get them to think about parts of it. So, um, you know, I, I was doing a talk on, I was involved in a debate at University College on euthanasia recently with someone from Dignity and Dying, and, and uh, we had quite a few questions afterwards, but then we went off to the pub for two hours with the, um, turned out to be the president of the Secular Society at University College, and this is the only university in Britain that didn't have a chaplain. And um, we were there for two hours, and, and I was asking all the questions. And they, um, you know, it was quite interesting, sort of tying them all up in knots, uh, starting to think about what they, uh, making some provocative statements first, but then just sort of probing them and gently and getting them to think and reflect on what they believed and then looking for the, the things to go in. And we spent the first half talking about what they believed and we spent the second half talking about the gospel and Jesus Christ. So I, I think, and the, the Lord was so good at asking questions, wasn't he? I mean, you know, right, right back Genesis 1, uh, you know, who told you you were naked? Where is your brother? Um, Job, we've got a whole three chapters of questions at the end of that book that God asks, and Jesus was always asking questions of people. And I think, I think sometimes we get stuck in this rut where we feel we've got to be saying things and making points, whereas in actual fact it's far more effective just to ask the questions and get people to, to think and then the, the opportunities will come. It also shows that we're willing to listen to them as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Chris? Uh, well, I, obviously I agree with that and I, I'd add, I think we, we should be doing things that provoke questions. If people aren't asking questions, it should make us wonder what we're doing because like some of the, you know, what, what Mez has been sharing there and other things we've been talking about, this is provocative stuff we're doing, and it does generate questions when people see the church active, you know, asking why we do these things, why we invest our lives in these things, why we behave the way we do. And so if we're not provoking questions, it should make us wonder what we're doing that should be so going under the radar. Because if we're real disciples of Christ, I know Jesus provoked a lot of questions and a lot of reaction, I think we should be provocative too. And uh, so the very fact that perhaps we're not getting questions should, should concern us because we should be, we should be provocative. And so some of the schemes that we've been talking about, some of the activities uh, believers are involved in, uh, heard about today, I think they're very exciting and those should generate questions that people will be asking. Okay, Mez? Yeah, I mean, I've, th yeah, it's a question I've never understood. I mean, I think just, I just say, guys, don't be a geek and you'll be fine, I think. <coughs> What I mean by that is just being that Christians are obsessed, sort of middle class Christians are obsessed with trying to get Jesus, like we're going to ram him somehow into the conversation. Have a conversation about flipping toilet paper, but somehow they're going to get the crossing. And um, it's just unnatural. Whereas my approach is if you're natural in yourself, you love the Lord, and you like people, people want to know you, they want to ask questions, they want to know. And so it's never. Um, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what, but it's, it's never a problem. We're, we always, um, we never run out of questions. I will say, culturally for us, the number one question in a scheme, without any shadow of a doubt, is, <clears throat> am I going to hell? Yeah. Which is, I remember some guys from a, a, another church came to see our work and they sat in a meeting and that was the question that came out and they were horrified that we were so bl bl brutal and blunt about it. But that is two questions that, two things you never have to worry about in a scheme. They, the concept of sin, and hell, because they are the number two questions that you get asked, which is an interesting yeah. cultural thing. That is, that is a really interesting cultural thing. Mez, this one's for you then. What can we do to help 20 schemes? Now, and, and in a way, you kind of indicated that, and, but yeah. is there anything you want to yeah. add to it? Write me a check. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, prayerful support, that's what Christians That's Christian prayerful support, it. that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I failed that track at Moorlands, fail that. Prayerful support. You could prayerfully support us by writing a check. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things. Obviously, we are very new. We only launched a couple of weeks ago. We are living by faith that the Lord's going to provide for this. Got no clue. Um, our, our aim is long term. It's a 20 year aim. We hope to see within the next 20 years, first fruits of it, sort of indigenous leaders being gro growing. 
because the generations have just been left without. It's, it's a bigger problem when we think this, we're not gonna, this is not going to happen overnight. It's like there's lots of church planting at the minute, these sexy three to five year business plans. And uh, it's, a, it's just ridiculous. It's not happening in, in scheme land. So we do need um, ongoing financial support. We need prayer. We need people with, who are willing to um, go against the culture and um, the sort of careerism, which is just rife in evangelical church, isn't it? Up, up, up. But we need people to reverse it and go, do you know what? I'm going to go down, down, down. And I was talking to a guy who came to, I won't give his name away, a, a week or so ago, and he, he's been offered jobs in quite prominent churches yeah. as a pastor. And I said, do you know what would be outrageous? If you turned down that big church job and moved into a housing scheme, that would freak people out, wouldn't it? Um, and he just laughed. <laughs> And you're laughing, and, and that's the problem. So we need people who've got some balls, um, men and women, and we need people who've got some money. And we need, we need to believe and understand that God is at work in massively powerful ways in housing schemes. And um, I think we're on the edge of, of, of a movement here that could really do some damage for Jesus. So I just pray. I'm, I'm going to ask you one question. The others can come in on this, and then we're going to, one more question each. That, well, the same question, you can each answer it, but this one is, because it really bothers me, and it's really beginning to get to me a wee bit, is the number of Christians who divide our communities into classes, middle class, you know, I mean, I know you use the term, and I know what you mean, but yeah. middle class, working class, and yeah. so on. And when they go to work in housing estates, yeah. to me, treat working class people as though they were entirely different. Uh, you know, not part of the human race, or if so, so different that, you know, yeah. quite paternalistic, quite patronizing. Yeah. Surely it's the case that if you're teaching the Christian gospel yeah. and you're being, you know, you go to the Bible, surely you should, you should be able to have churches which include people of all classes. Yeah. Or are you really saying, no, it's only got to be one class in each church? No, I think that all, I mean, if you come to a Nidri Community Church, we're a church with people who are master's graduates and people who've never finished school. Um, people who can read and write to high degrees and have got good high-powered jobs and actually keep the building open, um, and people who've never worked a lick in their life and need to get a grip of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the church is a... Re For me, the church should be a reflection of its community, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not saying schemey churches for schemey people. We're saying in these areas, there, uh, there is a lack of... I think it's your phone, Dave, is it? I know, I was <laughs> trying to avoid it. <laughs> Shall I, oh, hey, hey. Shall I answer it? After the ribbon I gave That's you. That's the Lord's <laughs> judgment, brother. That is the... It's oh. actually me ringing him. It's not. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I would say it, sh it should be made up of all. I mean... The one thing to work in a housing scheme you need is to genuinely love people. That's, yeah. the, that's the bottom line. End of discussion. Yeah. And surely there's something wrong if you're saying we have to, we can't have people come in, those sort of people come into our church and things like that. There's something wrong there. It's got to be the case that we should be able, you know, to worship and... But the issue is yeah. a problem. You know this from your own personal experience with, with, a, yeah. with, a, with a friend of ours. That the issue is problematic in discipleship. Yeah. Churches are structured particularly lots of, and I, I'll use the term, but you understand what I mean, middle-class churches, more professionalized churches, they're structured in such a way, if I've got 61% of my demographic are unemployed and they're not working, they haven't worked for generations. Yeah. I mean, that's a sin we haven't even talked about, but they haven't worked for generations and they're around all day. Community looks different than the yeah. person who's working, <laughs> nine to, you know, working all the hours, very professional. Yeah. They've got barely enough time to see their own children, never mind do community yeah. with an unemployed person. So there are complex issues yeah. at play here, I would. Yeah. So it's not as simple as that. I mean, it, it, it is very complex. And, uh, and what I appreciate about your work is that you, you, know, you recognize that. Each of you, we're going to finish with this. It's a very simple and straightforward question. It's the most profound question you can ever answer. It's got to be Jesus. The answer's got to be Jesus. The answer's got to be Jesus. Says Mez. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Mez, the answer can't be Jesus because the question is Jesus. Okay. What does Jesus mean to you? What does Jesus mean to me? Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. So that means that he is the ultimate solution to all of these questions that we, we, we bring up and that we raise. And that I think uh, I have to go back to him for strength, 
for direction and ultimately for the purpose of what we're trying to do as well. I'm accountable to him. In the end, whatever I may achieve or not achieve in my pastoral ministry where I am or in college, I'm ultimately resourced by him, but I'm accountable to him as well. And all of us one day are answerable to him. And he is the one from whom I want to hear those words, well done and good and faithful servant. And it, that's in his hands. That's what he means to me. Peter? Yeah, how do you say it? Everything, just, just everything. I, it, it's the, I love those words at the end of John 6, you know, when Jesus preached that Bread of Life sermon and it was pretty tough. And people went away just one by one and, and then the, there were just the 12 there and he turns around to them and says, and what about you? Are you going to go to? And Peter says, well, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where would we go? And so you know, when you realise that we're talking here about the creator and sustainer of the whole universe who humbled himself, became a man, was nailed to a piece of wood for our sin in order that we might have a relationship with God, a future and a hope, and live with him for all eternity. And when you realise who he is, what can you do but, but follow him and want to give everything to him? And, you know, similarly, I, I, I long to hear those words, you know, well, well done. Well, it would probably be, you really messed up, but <laughs> it's like my, my brother always says to me, Peter, cheer up, you're much worse than you think. <laughs> And, it, and uh, it doesn't matter because, um, you know, he paid for it all. It's, it's everything. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Jesus is the reason I get up in the morning. Jesus is the reason I don't beat my wife and commit adultery like the rest of my brothers and the rest of my family, and my dad and my uncles. Jesus is the reason that I've got a family. Jesus is the reason I baptised my 11-year-old daughter last week. Jesus is the, the reason... For my ministry, and you know, when I die, I'm, I'm, you know, I think the Lord will colloquially say to me, "Nice one, me old mucker," <laughs> and that'll do for me. I think that would do for us all. Um, I want to thank uh, Chris for coming all the way up from England, and Peter as well for coming all the way from New Zealand or England, <laughs> and Mez for uh, substituting for John Lennox. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No. No. I, 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 me and Dawkins would have a great debate. You would. <laughs> I'd love to see. I'd pay to see you debate Dawkins. It's, it's an easy debate. Natural selection to like survival of the fittest. Yeah. Bang. Cage fight. <laughs> <laughs> can you set that up? I can. I'll set up a cage fight between you and Dawkins. We'll work that one out. I, I have. I actually have a lot of people. I, I, I'm, I need to thank. We're going to finish by singing. Um, in Christ alone. I, I do thank these three guys. Uh, I, I'm not, I had a list of things, and the list was just too long. So, you know, Tim has obviously put a huge amount of work into this, our solace administrator. Uh, Sylvie has worked like a Trojan and deserves two weeks' holiday, which she's not going to get. Her reward will be in heaven. Um, and uh, many, many others have really contributed. I, I'm very grateful to the Congregation St. Peter's uh, Chris there is our, our steward. He's been marshalling people around. It's been great. People who've really committed. There's a lot of work needs to go into this. Uh, we thank you for coming, uh, for uh, all that, that has been going on. I think uh, you'll appreciate, well, I, I think you, from what you've been saying, that it has been a really good day. I've been very, very encouraged by it. And uh, we've got a, a, a nation to win for Christ. And whether it's through the 20 schemes or uh, through being doctors or, or going off to more lands and learning some decent theology like Mez did and then putting it into practice. Uh, that's, that's what we've got to, that, that's where we're at and it's just been really, really good. So can you just please thank everybody who's been helpful with us. Thanks guys. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. <laughs> Hand the mic back to them.
people in Scotland, and I would also say people in the United Kingdom and probably in most of Europe, are more open to the gospel now than I've known, ever known. But the church is less prepared to communicate it. We live in such a post-Christian culture that we're encountering people now who have no conception of what the gospel is. They're not resistant to it, they just don't know what it is. And our challenge as Christians is how do we convey the gospel into the public square, into the halls of power, into the marketplace, into education and media in such a way that engages people. People do not know about Jesus Christ, they have no idea. And asking people to believe in Jesus when they haven't a clue who he is, who's Jesus? you know, tell me about Jesus. They have no concept of Christianity. We're basically bringing up people who are fundamentally ignorant of the gospel and who are being brought up within the framework of a secular thought that completely excludes any concept of the supernatural. We want to take the gospel into the public square and show how as Christians we don't need to retreat from places like Edinburgh and the centres of power, rather we can go in and the gospel will stand up as it's always stood up. We want to engage in evangelism that influences in a place like Edinburgh. At the same time, we also want to be equipping Christians and the church to do the same. As you explore our website, I wanted to encourage you to check out a number of different resources we have there. We have a magazine, we have podcasts, we have videos, all kinds of rich resources that you can use in your personal evangelism. And also we encourage you to use them to teach and train and equip others in your churches and your communities to do the same. Make use of them, download them, share them with your friends. And we also encourage you to pray for us, stand alongside us and look to partner with us. We love to come alongside churches and organisations and individuals to help you take the gospel into your neighbourhood. And we look forward to partnering with you in seeing God's kingdom extend here in Scotland and across the UK.